Welcome to the Coin Bureau Weekly Crypto Review. Here are this week's top headlines in the crypto news. The bird is the B-word. Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey's corporate Bitcoin event brings the bull market back on track. Did Elon Musk's comments really cause the crypto rebound? Bullish announcements across the board. JP Morgan allows its advisors to dabble in crypto trusts. Goldman Sachs present bullish stats and Fidelity projects most institutions will soon own crypto. Which cryptos are on their radar? Ethereum's expanding ecosystem. Reddit chooses a layer 2 scaling solution for its community tokens, while Ethereum's proof-of-stake transition proposal lands on GitHub. Could we see Ethereum 2.0 by the end of the year? Stablecoin Wars Episode 1 – The Phantom Collateral Circle reveals the assets backing its USDC stablecoin, and Paxos responds in kind. Why are these two stablecoin titans suddenly locking horns? Regulatory tensions rise for DeFi. Uniswap delists multiple token pairs from its decentralized exchange in anticipation of a potential regulatory crackdown. What does this mean for the future of DeFi? FTX ready and set. After nearly a billion dollars in funding, the famous futures exchange buys back its own shares from Binance and begins its mission to buy out Wall Street's biggest banks and trading platforms. Why this move could send some cryptos to the moon. And a closer look at the crypto market recovery in this week's Crypto Market Forecast. All this and more in just a moment. Good morning, afternoon or evening. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Guy and what you're about to see is educational content, not financial advice. Now, you can find any topics you're looking for using the timestamps in the video timeline. And now for today's top stories. Last Wednesday, Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey, Tesla and SpaceX CEO Elon Musk, and ARK Invest CEO Kathy Wood got together to talk about the institutional adoption of Bitcoin as part of the B-Word event. In the first few minutes of their hour-long discussion, Elon Musk casually commented that SpaceX now holds Bitcoin and that the techno king himself holds cryptocurrency too. Most of Mr. Musk's crypto holdings are in BTC, with smaller positions in ETH and Doge. Now, I, for one, would like to know what large and small holdings are, given that this is one of the richest men in the world. Anyways, in addition to revealing his holdings, Elon noted that it was only a matter of time before Tesla began accepting Bitcoin payments again, given that Bitcoin's mining has become much greener. Not only that, but Elon actually pressed Jack to enable crypto payments on Twitter during their one-hour discussion. Now, these comments had a predictable effect on the price of Bitcoin, which began to rally out of the nasty dip it had experienced just two days before. However, this rally was likely not driven by retail investors who make up less than 15% of all the trading volume on any given day. As I'll be explaining later this week, not even the billions of dollars in stimulus checks had a sizable impact on Bitcoin, which is probably the opposite of what you've heard up to this point. What this means is that the money that moved the market last week came from institutions. Many of them were probably waiting for a cause to justify the effect of their investing. It's also possible that the B word was the signal to institutions that it's time to get in or get left behind, and the announcements that followed suggests this might be the case. As reported by Bitcoin Magazine, Jack Dorsey told Twitter's top shareholders that they must, quote, invest aggressively in Bitcoin less than 24 hours after the B word event ended. That same day, JP Morgan became the first bank to allow its retail wealth management clients to invest in a series of exchange-traded cryptocurrency products. To put things into context, this cohort of JP Morgan's clientele hold nearly $700 billion in assets with the bank. For now, JP Morgan's crypto offerings are limited to Grayscale's Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum, and Ethereum Classic trusts, as well as Osprey's Bitcoin trust, which I can't say rings any bells. Some other American banks, like Goldman Sachs, also offer cryptocurrency products, but only to high net worth clients. Speaking of Goldman Sachs, a recent survey they conducted found that a substantial percentage of the world's richest families are heavily invested in cryptocurrency. 
15% of surveyed family offices currently hold crypto, with 45% of them saying that they're concerned about currency debasement, aka inflation. The most significant finding is seen here in the title of the Decrypt article which details the study. It found that 18% of the world's wealthiest families see cryptocurrency as an inflation hedge. This ties into Fidelity's own survey of institutional investors, which found that over 90% of them plan on owning crypto by 2026. According to Fidelity's survey, 70% of these institutional investors said they planned on buying crypto in the near future. And something tells me they began doing that just after the B-word event. As with the wealthy families, the primary motivation for institutional investors stems from concerns about the current financial system, especially the insane amount of stimulus money being printed by central banks around the world. This runs contrary to a recent in-depth report by the Bank of International Settlements, which claimed that investments in cryptocurrency had nothing to do with distrust in the current financial system. Now, if you're curious about the other crazy claims they made in that report, be sure to watch my video all about it using the link in the top right. Meanwhile, in Ethereum land, Reddit announced that they have chosen Arbitrum to help them launch their Layer 2 scaling solution for their Ethereum-based community point system. For those unfamiliar, Reddit's community point system seeks to incentivize quality discussion on its various subreddits by rewarding users with ERC20 tokens belonging to that subreddit's community. The feature was initially rolled out last May in a limited format, with community points only being available on R cryptocurrency and R Fortnite BR. These community points can of course be traded on decentralized exchanges, but claiming, transferring and trading tokens can cost quite a bit of gas because of, well, Ethereum. Like Ethereum's optimism, Arbitrum uses optimistic rollups to batch multiple Ethereum transactions into one to increase transaction speeds and save on gas fees. Also like optimism, Arbitrum currently does not have a token, though this is sort of irrelevant given that Reddit is building its own custom layer too with the help of Offchain Labs, the company behind the Arbitrum blockchain. Reddit's Layer 2 is already in its testing stage, meaning we should see it go live sometime in August. It wouldn't surprise me at all if it just so happened to overlap with Ethereum's EIP-1559 upgrade scheduled for August 4th. Now on that note, Ethereum's development team recently revealed the next Ethereum improvement proposal numbered 3675 on Ethereum's GitHub page. EIP-3675 concerns Ethereum's transition from proof-of-work to proof-of-stake, something which was originally scheduled to take place at the tail end of the Ethereum 2.0 roadmap. According to Ethereum's top devs, this roadmap reordering happened because there have been, quote, no safety nor liveness features detected since ETH 2.0's staking began in December last year. In plain English, everything is going smoothly. Now, if Ethereum's proof-of-stake stability continues, we could theoretically see Ethereum transition to proof-of-stake by December, though Ethereum founder Vitalik Buterin believes this is very unlikely. Now, if you want to get my most recent Ethereum analysis, you can find it up there in the top right. Now, in last week's crypto review, I mentioned that the top financial regulators in the United States would be meeting to discuss stablecoins. This group is apparently dubbed the, quote, President's Working Group on Financial Markets, which is a little bit ironic given that apparently not much work was done during the stablecoin meeting. As reported by Decrypt, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen just said that they, quote, need to act quickly to ensure there is an appropriate US regulatory framework in place. To that end, the PwC will issue recommendations to regulators in the coming months. Months. On the one hand, this is positive news because I predicted last week that we would see some sort of regulation set up in the interim, and I'm happy to see that I was dead wrong. On the other hand, this is negative news because it means regulations could come out of nowhere and affect one or more cryptocurrency stablecoins. This would have a devastating effect on the crypto market. This possibility seems to have been the motivation behind Circle's sudden move towards even greater transparency, which Circle's CEO Jeremy Allaire detailed in a blog post the very next day. 
Now, as is often the case these days, the devil is in the detail when it comes to how crypto projects describe certain things. In this case, the meaning of dollar backed. As you can see here, only 61% of the USDC in circulation is backed by cash and cash equivalents, with the rest being backed by government bonds and corporate bonds, which is basically debt. This prompted Paxos to push out its own pro-transparency propaganda, along with a breakdown of the assets backing Pax, Binance's BUSD, and Gemini's GUSD, 96% of which are cash and cash equivalents. Paxos even went as far as to claim that neither USDT nor USDC are truly stablecoins due to their lack of cash collateral. My suspicion is that Circle and Paxos believe there will be just one stablecoin standing at the end of this race, and they're trying to paint the target on each other's backs. This feud could even be an extension of the not-so-subtle competition going on between Binance and Coinbase, given that the former is partnered with Paxos and the latter with Circle. I'll be taking a closer look at all of this stablecoin stuff and what it means for the crypto market later this week, so be sure to stay tuned for that. I'll also be discussing the regulatory implications this sort of stablecoin collateral could have, especially since SEC Chairman Gary Gensler recently hinted that stablecoins could potentially be unregistered securities. This is because securities include things like stocks and derivatives, i.e., assets that derive their value from some other asset. Gary's comments might have caused Uniswap's most recent controversial move. Last Friday, Uniswap shook the crypto community to the core when Uniswap Labs announced that it would be delisting certain tokens from its decentralized exchange. The full list of affected tokens can be found on Uniswap's GitHub, which is not easy to go through if you're not a developer. From what I was able to gather, all synthetic tokens from crypto projects like Synthetics and UMA have been banned, as well as tokenized stocks from Terra's Mirror Protocol and, oddly enough, Tether's gold-backed token XAUT. More than a thousand people protested the move on Twitter, asking why Uni token holders had no say in the matter and claiming that this is the beginning of the end for Uniswap. Uniswap founder Hayden Adams responded by highlighting the fact that there is a difference between the Uniswap interface and the Uniswap protocol. This is because the interface is the centralized website owned and operated by Uniswap Labs, and the protocol itself is governed by the community. Besides the fact that there have been ample problems on the community governance side as well, many are starting to wonder if and when Uniswap will force traders to use KYC to access their DEX via the Uniswap interface. To add insult to injury, comments made by Uniswap's growth lead during a presentation at the Ethereum Community Conference last week suggest this is a very real possibility. Now, this talk was mysteriously deleted on YouTube, but re-uploaded to Filecoin's interplanetary file system, presumably because it discusses Uniswap's own discussions with large players such as PayPal and Robinhood. As far as I understand, these big players want to integrate with Uniswap, but are hesitant to do so because of a lack of KYC on Uniswap's end. Because what exactly was said during the 20-minute presentation is open to interpretation, I'll leave a link to the full video in the description for you to watch and interpret. In my opinion, it's more likely that Uniswap will roll out a permissioned DEX in the same way that Aave has rolled out permissioned pools for its borrowing and lending protocol. Whether this will be enough to satisfy regulators remains to be seen, but at the rate that cryptocurrency is growing, the crypto lobbyists should be able to keep any severe sanctions at bay. Some of the best examples of just how powerful the crypto industry has become can be seen in the high-profile sponsorships I detailed in my video about the top crypto partnerships so far this year. One of the crypto companies I covered in that video was FTX, and though I only focused on FTX's sponsorship of Major League Baseball, FTX has been doing much more than marketing. Last week, FTX raised over $900 million from over 60 investors and VC firms, including Coinbase Ventures. This gives FTX an estimated valuation of $18 billion. Now, it seems that FTX used some of this capital to buy back the shares that had been purchased by Binance, which was one of FTX's earliest investors. 
FTX CEO Sam Bankman-Fried explained in an interview with Decrypt that he did this because, quote, there are some differences between how we run our businesses. This is a not-so-subtle reference to Binance's regulatory issues, which could impede FTX's own ambitions to expand its footprint in the United States via FTX US if they continue their partnership. Binance CEO Changpeng Zhao is apparently okay with the separation, especially since FTX's valuation has increased by 14x over the last year. FTX's exponential growth continues along with the crypto market, and Sam plans to use this momentum to make serious acquisitions in legacy markets. Earlier this month, Sam said FTX may someday buy Goldman Sachs or the CME Futures Exchange, which is the largest futures exchange in the world. Knowing Sam, my money is on the latter. These sorts of acquisitions could have a profound effect on Solano, which hosts FTX's project Serum simply because it's the fastest cryptocurrency on the market. While doing research for my last video about Solana, I recall Anatoly Yakovenko noting that their goal is to provide an even more efficient back-end to legacy trading systems. If FTX buys said legacy trading systems, then I reckon it's only logical to assume that Solana will play a role in that, but we probably won't see it happen anytime soon. First, we need to finish getting out of this bear trap, and this brings me to the weekly crypto market forecast. In my recent video about what's going on in the crypto market, I considered the possibility that we may not be in the Wyckoff accumulation phase I've been tracking over the last few weeks. However, the price action we've seen since Wednesday leads me to believe that we are in a Wyckoffian pattern of some kind. As you can see here, I've put Bitcoin's daily price action into three boxes. The first is the Wyckoff distribution pattern that Uncomplication first spotted in late April. Now, the second is not a Wyckoff accumulation, but a textbook Wyckoff redistribution. This is where prices fall and begin to rally, only to fall down lower into the actual accumulation phase, which is what I believe we're now moving out of. Although I'm still hesitant to use any kind of technical analysis under these market conditions, I am confident enough to say that we are out of the hole and moving back up. I reckon that's pretty self-evident. Even so, we are likely to see some turbulence during the next week as we test a couple of last points of support, and that means altcoins are going to be extremely volatile. I expect the crypto market to rally the week after next because of Ethereum's upcoming upgrade, and I'll have a better vantage point for you around that time. This week's winners are Axie Infinity, Telcoin, Theta, Quant Network, and OKX's OKB token. When it comes to AXS, I released a video on it about a week ago, and since that time, prices have only continued their parabolic rise. I can't seem to find anything specific that pumped it so much. But that said, the core demand driver for AXS seems to be coming from the continued popularity of Axie Infinity, whose Ronin browser extension wallet recently surpassed a whopping 800,000 downloads. Axie Infinity has also officially turned more NFT trading volume than any other NFT platform, inching out over NBA Top Shots, which previously held the title. It looks like AXS is slowly painting a bull flag on the daily, which means we could see another massive pump later this week or early next week. My bet is on early next week because of that Ethereum update. Next, we have Telcoin, and Telcoin's pump seems to be coming from its partnership with Polygon to enable fast and near zero fee payments to users around the world. Polygon is, of course, Ethereum's preferred Layer 2 scaling solution, which also saw a sizable pump over the last week, though not enough to make the cut this time around. Unfortunately, Telcoin's recent pump has only brought it a hair closer to its all-time high. Fortunately, though, it looks like Tel has finally broken that downwards trend. A similar pattern can be seen with Theta, which is another altcoin that has been bleeding badly since mid-May. The Theta token seems to be rallying on the news that Theta Labs will be adding optimization upgrades to Theta 3.0, which went live on June the 30th. You can watch my most recent video about Theta if you want to know what 3.0 is all about, and you can find it in the usual spot, top right. In terms of where Theta is headed next, I can't say for sure. Like Telcoin, Theta faces a mountain of resistance around key price points, namely the $6.50 and $7 range. I personally think Theta's T-Fuel token has more potential at this point in time, 
and you can watch my video about theta to find out why that is. On to Quant Network, the QNT token is booming on the news that the Overledger demo app has been released. This allows developers to create decentralized applications using multiple cryptocurrency blockchains, which is honestly pretty big news. It's been a while since I last covered Quant Network, and I suspect QNT's constant weekly winner ranking is the universe telling me that an update video is long overdue. So another video is in the works, never fear. Finally, we have OKX's OKB token, which seems to be climbing because of the cryptocurrency trading competition currently taking place on OKX in celebration of the Olympics in Tokyo, which began on Friday. My diagnosis is the same as last week, and that's that OKB is an exchange token that rides or dies depending on what OKX is doing. This can offer predictable and consistent gains in the long term, but to nowhere near the same degree as other cryptos with more fundamentals. Also, with much larger risks proportional to the reward. You can learn more about OKB and other exchange tokens by watching my video about them, and it's of course up there in the top right. Well, that's all for today's Coin Bureau Weekly Crypto Review. So, if you enjoyed it, you know what to do. Hit that like button, subscribe button, and bell icon too. If you want more of me, head on over to Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram to get a sneak peek behind the scenes. If you join my Telegram channel, you'll get the daily crypto updates you crave, and signing up for my weekly newsletter is a great way to get the tools, tips, and tricks you need to get paid. And of course, you can support the channel by heading over to the Coin Bureau merch store and picking up a shirt or hoodie or both. Links to all these resources are in the description. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all in next week's episode.